very warm welcome to this evening's edition of Fine Print with me, Molly Gampir. On October 26, Sri Lankan Prime Minister Rana Vikramasinghe was overthrown by Sri Lanka's president. He appointed a new Prime Minister, Mahindra Rajapaksi. Today, 48 days later, Vikramasinghe has the last laugh, it seems. Sri Lanka's Supreme Court today ruled against President Sirisena and declared that the parliament cannot be dissolved. The top court called the president's moves as unconstitutional. The seven-judge bench verdict means that President Sirisena has to reconvene parliament and Ranul Vikramasinghe will be back as prime minister for now. The court ruled that President Sirisena's decision to call for snap elections was illegal and overturned it. The sacking of the prime minister, Ranul Vikramasinghe, stands null and void. It was a unanimous decision by all seven judges on the bench. Let's just take a look back at what all transpired over the last two months. It all began on October 26th when President Sirisena's party ended ties with Prime Minister Vikramasinghe's party the same day Sirisena appointed Mahindra Rajpakse as the Prime Minister. On November 9th, the President dissolved the Parliament and called for snap elections. Three days later, on November 12th, the country's top court stayed the order on dissolution of Parliament. On November 14, the parliament passed a no-confidence motion against the president appointed prime minister. The case went back to the judiciary and the court banned Rajpaksi from functioning as the prime minister on December 3rd. And today, the court's verdict coming as a big blow to the president as his move to call snap elections was deemed illegal and his move deemed as unconstitutional. Ranul Vikramasinghe took to Twitter minutes after the verdict was pronounced. He tweeted, and I'm quoting, We trust that the president will promptly respect the judgment of the courts. The legislature, judiciary and the executive are equally important pillars of a democracy and the checks and balances that they provide are crucial to ensuring the sovereignty of its citizens. We are happy that the verdict is unanimous and uh, it, it, I, I'm sure the people of Sri Lanka will welcome this wholeheartedly and they probably relieved that we have democracy has been established again and going forward I'm, I hope the authorities concerned will honour this and uh, act accordingly. Unanimous verdict of seven judges uh, holding that uh, Gazette notification by the President dissolving Parliament was done unconstitutionally outside of the law and uh, declaring it to be uh, null and void. Uh, this case was argued for days. All counsel were heard in full um, and eventually uh, the Supreme Court in a very short time has deliberated and reached a unanimous uh, conclusion. Uh, it will no doubt go down in history as one of the uh, most important uh, decisions made by the Supreme Court. Mahindra Rajpaksi, who was appointed as the Prime Minister by Sirisena, had lost two trust votes in the Parliament. And now this verdict coming as another huge setback. Rajpaksi's son and a member of parliament in Lanka tweeted, and I'm quoting, we respect the decision of Lanka Supreme Court despite the fact that we have reservations regarding its interpretation. We will continue to stand alongside those calling for a parliamentary election without which there is no real justice for the people of Sri Lanka. Joining us live from Colombo is Professor Rajiva Vijasena, political analyst. Uh, Professor, what happens next? Uh, does the court order today mean further chaos for Sri Lanka or is this a huge step towards restoration of democracy? Well, I think the alternatives you put are not exactly the way I would look at it myself. I think the court decision is very clear that parliament cannot be dissolved. I think there is a lot of ambiguity in the Constitution, but where there is ambiguity, you have to leave it to the courts to rule, and the courts have made a unanimous judgment, which means Parliament must go on unless it decides to dissolve itself for at least another uh, 15 months. Uh, but I think in your introduction, you slightly confused issues because the question of dismissing Ranil Vikramasinghe as Prime Minister was an entirely separate question. There, too, there is ambiguity in the Constitution. 
but uh, it's as if it were less ambiguous, and I think that's the reason why the UNP didn't challenge that decision. And as uh, far as the legal position goes, the dismissal of Ranil Vikrasinghe by the president still stands in the absence of a Supreme Court uh, verdict overturning it. Uh, what was also clear is that the president is entitled to appoint someone who, in his opinion, which is stupid phrasing, but that's the way the Constitution has been since 1977, commands a majority in the House. And having appointed uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa, uh, although there was a certain amount of, uh, let us say, confusion in the way the Speaker put these no-confidence motions, he should have followed due procedure. But because he was a bit hasty, you know, first he said he recognizes Mahindra Rajapaksa, then he said he doesn't, then he said, you know, we'll have the vote of no confidence, we'll have the voice vote. Um, I think it's very clear that Mahindra Rajapaksa does not have a majority in the House. Um, but therefore, Sirisena should, if he doesn't resign, Sirisena should dismiss him. But it's then open to him to appoint another prime minister. And he's made it very clear that he will not appoint Ranil Vikram Singh. And the prerogative is his. So you still have a bit of a stalemate, but I do hope that both sides, as it were, will look at the matter as something that should be resolved in the interests of the country and uh, within the UNP itself, which has more seats than the SLFP, but not a majority, pick a candidate who can, uh, in a sense, govern by consensus for the next year. It's very much an interim government because the people are still waiting for an election and uh, unfortunately, this government, uh, led by Vikram Singh, but with Sirisena conniving at it, has postponed provincial council elections now for, you know, well over a year in three provinces and in another three, four, a couple of months. And they've been manipulating the law in order to do this. But mm. our provincial council elections, which if you remember, India helped to establish in 1987, have just not existed now for ages. And I think that's particularly shocking. And I hope we will at least have those elections, which should not have been postponed, happening very soon. The local government elections were postponed by two or three years. And the result, when it came, was uh, a massive victory for Mahindra Rajapaksa right. against both Sirisena and Vikram Singh. And I think that gave them a feeling that the country was on their side. Right, Professor. But I think that can only be tested when due elections are held, when due. Right. Do the uh, proceedings today also open the way for potential impeachment uh, uh, motion against the president? No, I wouldn't have thought so at all, because uh, there is clearly ambiguity. Uh, impeachment, don't forget, requires a simple majority to, to um, uh, put it in motion, but it requires a two-thirds majority. And, you know, some of the people who have supported Vikram Singh have said very clearly they will not support an impeachment. Um, and I think that would be a confrontation that Vikram Singh would want to avoid. You see, he knows he's very unpopular, and I don't think he'd want an election at all. And he wouldn't like the politics of revenge. I mean, one of the problems with what we call Rajapaksa's resurgence, as you know, I was one of those who crossed over to support Sirisena, but I told the government, just do not start persecuting him. You know, treat him with respect. He's lost an election. But because of the persecution, Rajapaksa was determined to come back. Right. And uh, he's still a very strong personality. Do you agree with what uh, Namal Rajapaksa says, that the only way out of this stalemate is uh, calling for fresh election? No, I think what is needed is compromise on all sides. And the president made it very clear some time back that he would be happy to have another prime minister from the UNP. Don't forget the UNP is deeply divided into two wings, uh, what I would call the old-fashioned UNP which has a certain level of commitment to the rural peasantry. And the Jawad and the Vikram Singh UNP, which is very much, uh, you know, Colombo commercial interest. And as I said, the, the consequences of what they've been doing, including the appalling bond scam, you know, where they made a lot of money at the expense of the country and driving interest rates up, really alienated the country at large. And that is why the Rajapaksa new party got 45%. Right. And one of the reasons I was very much against the dissolution when it happened, you know, I said that Sirisena shouldn't have done it, was that I feared that if there was an election, we'd have a landslide for Rajapaksa's party. And I don't think landslides are good for anyone. I think you feel the same in India now.
Joining us live from Hong Kong now is Andrew K.P. Leung, International and Independent Strategist. Andrew, help us understand what do you think is going on here? Well, at the heart of it all uh, is a, um, um, a, a new ball game um, in the relationship between China and the United States. Um, the United States as an existing superpower um, is seeing China as its potential challenger. So it's now pushing back 360 degrees against China, of which trade war is only part of the picture. Uh, so this is the broad context. But as far as the trade war is concerned, of course, uh, some of China's trade practices uh, leave a lot to be desired. And there are genuine concerns in the United States. And these concerns are uh, across um, both sides of the aisle as, as cross party, uh, and even the Democratic Party. Um, is of course uh, also concerned with some of the tra uh, trade practices. But um, uh, 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 this arrest of this lady, though, uh, causes a, a lot of problems for China because um, Huawei is uh, regarded as a, a national champion, uh, highly respected in China. And this lady is the daughter of the founder uh, of, of Huawei, uh, which uh, is the leader in 5G technology. As you know, 5G uh, uh, is going to re redefine how businesses are conducted and also uh, is a game changer, even in the military. So that's why um, uh, the case is so sensitive um, uh, for both China and the United States. Now, these two uh, Canadians, though, um, um, the, the gentleman appears to be working for the International Crisis Group, um, according to the statement uh, from Beijing. And the International Crisis Group uh, also, um, t uh, always works on very sensitive uh, matters uh, touching on national security. So that, that gentleman uh, may be uh, contravening uh, some of the rules um, uh, on national security in China. And there was a lady, a Canadian lady, her profile is slightly different, uh, ostensibly, uh, nothing to do with national security, but that can be a front. So, and then both persons are seen by China now uh, as uh, infringing upon uh, China's national security. So this case, uh, uh, th th these two cases, Canadian cases, um, may or may not be um, uh, uh, totally sort of um, related uh, to uh, the trade war uh, with the United States. But you're and saying in fact, they will certainly have a bearing on the trade tensions? Well, the timing, of course, is very, very sensitive. Um, but uh, arresting these two uh, Canadians uh, is not going to change the, the game with the United States, you see. Um, but of course, it, it puts pressure on uh, Canada. Right. Um, now, um, um, President Trump, um, well, as of yesterday, um, made the statement saying that, well, if, the, if this particular case uh, of this Chinese lady, um, the daughter of the founder of Huawei, uh, if her case would help the United States uh, improve its national security, improve its uh, leverage against uh, China, then uh, Trump, uh, that he he's, he, he, he's not above intervene, uh, 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 interfering with this or intervening in this case. Now, this statement uh, Im immediately prompted a response from Canada, right. because Canada is not uh, exactly a banana republic and, 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 and pays a lot of uh, emphasis uh, on the independence of the ju judiciary. So, um, and of course, Canada would like it to be seen uh, that this case is handled according to the law and the law and the legal process is allowed to take its due course. Um, so I think that uh, the cases must be seen this way, but at the heart of it all is a confront, um, geopolitical rivalry between the United States and China, of which trade is only part of the picture. And these two Canadians, uh, it could be um, just a case of, of, of convenience or coincidence and would come in handy. As Indeed, such a that's very just one of the facets of that equation. We're going to leave it there for the moment, though, Andrew. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. That's why, uh, that's why it says you are the only our friend there now. So we want to, wanted to... I want to be. With you and... Yes, I want to be and I feel uh, what you think. But... Uh, uh, practical connection, communication is impossible for me uh, to come out. I know that it would be fruitful. But what I want to 
uh, mean that yeah, I will meet your man here, you can get the message. But now what I like to request you that from your side, if you can uh, cooperate with China, then uh, in yes, Bangladesh yes, that will be useful uh, before the That's election. A- that is already that is already on the table and uh, it is being uh, done. So that's why we wanted that you, uh, as a main representative, uh, whenever it is possible to visit the places, it would have been better uh, because in person you would have uh, talked to them also. But uh, now, as you are saying that it is little not possible for you, not for uh, personally, if you can, if you want. From your this office, if you want any alternative person, I can arrange. But uh, for me, it is not possible. Okay, okay. I understood your point. And uh, uh, along with this, uh, keep trying. Maybe one uh, uh, sometime it is possible for you to come out on some reason, maybe on medical reason or maybe on uh, going for Umrah, etc. So uh, we can arrange a meeting there. But uh, meanwhile, yeah. we will uh, we will uh, try to remain in contact with, with you through uh, uh, somebody there at uh, uh, in in our office. Is it okay? Yes. If you can assign somebody from your office here, I can uh, time and uh, different time I can communicate to you or your site. So sometime we will uh, continue communicating with each other. I got to this point what you have told me, and uh, this I will definitely convey to my boss, and uh, uh, we will uh, work on this, and I will apprise you about this. About it. But at the same time, uh, uh, we will see how to uh, remain in communication uh, from your uh, from your place, and at the, uh, and and continue uh, finding opportunity. Uh, outside also. Right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on for now, after days of negotiations in Sweden, representatives of Yemen's warring parties, the Iran-backed Houthi rebels and the internationally supported government of Yemen agreed to take important steps towards possible peace. The Houthis and the Yemen government officials came face to face in a high-profile negotiation for the first time in two years. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres personally travelled to the venue to support the UN Special Envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffiths. And it seems to have worked. The two sides agreed on a ceasefire deal for the port of Hodeida. The deal includes complete ceasefire and withdrawal of troops from the port, which is a lifeline for the millions of Yemenis facing starvation. Withdrawing troops from the port is a step towards working on a possible UN takeover of the crucial Hodeida port. You have reached an agreement on Odaida port and city, which will see a mutual redeployment of forces from the port and the city and the establishment of a a governorate-wide ceasefire. The UN will play a leading role in the port, and this will facilitate the humanitarian access and the flow of goods to the civilian population. The warring parties also agreed to reopen the Sana'a airport in the Houthi-held capital. The two parties have agreed that international flights would uh, stop at a government-held airport before flying in or out of Sana'a. The safety procedures would be overseen by the United Nations. The Houthi rebels agreed to withdraw before from the port and then from also other areas of the city, allowing perhaps the United Nations peacekeeping forces to reach in order to guarantee the safety of all those humanitarian convoys reaching the port of Odeida. Therefore, a ceasefire, a new lifeline for the civilian population in Odeida. This will definitely help Yemen to get back on track and the civilians to fight the starvation that they have been facing in the last months.